You're in for a real treat this evening. I am blessed to be able to welcome Aubrey de Grey to Virtual Futures. So my name is Luke Robert Mason, and I'm the director of Virtual Futures. And for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim hidden behind the brush steel, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno parties was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Aubrey de Grey. He's the Chief Science Officer of the SENS Foundation, who are focused on strategies for engineering negligible senescence. In other words, they are leading the way when it comes to drawing a roadmap to defeat biological aging. This is no easy task, and it is one that will radically change what it means to be human. But that's what make, it makes Aubrey uh, unique. And it's his great deal of optimism that he possesses when faced with this very unique challenge. He's often been quoted as provocatively proposing that the first human beings who will live to a thousand are, have already been born. It is therefore no surprise that he is often a magnet for controversy. Many in the scientific community are divided over their support for his projects, but this hasn't dampened his efforts. To date, nobody has done more to advocate for the design of interventions to repair or stop the damage caused uh, by bi biological aging. So, in the immortal words of uh, Queen's Freddie Mercury, who wants to live forever? Well, to find out how, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Aubrey de Grey to the Virtual Futures stage. So, Aubrey, you believe that aging is the world's most important problem. Can you tell us why you believe this? <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I'll do that. Rather, and because I like you so much, I won't make too much fun of your spectacularly pretentious introduction. It's going to be a long night. Huh? Um, um, Let's go, Aubrey. Um, right. So, so um, uh, well, I mean, to me, there's, on, there's, there's obviously only one way to measure the question of whether problem X is more serious than problem Y. And that is in terms of the amount of suffering that is caused by the problem. Modulated, weighted, I guess, by the um, question of whether the problem or the extent to which the problem is amenable to alleviation by feasible, foreseeable human endeavor. So uh, I think that for me, the fundamental reason why aging is the world's most important problem is the combination of those two things. First of all, that it unequivocally causes far more suffering than anything else that we have to experience these days. And second of all, that contrary to the impression that most of humanity has forced themselves into, it is indeed a problem which is potentially amenable to technological intervention, specifically medical intervention. That's all it is for me. So why has the elimination of aging become so personally important to you? So it became personally important to me in my mid-twenties, so 30 or so years ago, when I became aware of the utterly horrifying fact that most people don't get it. Most people have made their peace with aging to such a fun profound extent that they have genuinely convinced themselves that it is some kind of blessing in disguise and or that it's so utterly, you know, wound into the fabric of the universe that there is not even in principle anything that we could ever do about it. Therefore, there's no point in thinking about it. I 
only became aware of this relatively late in life, in my mid-20s, because I had never asked people the question. I had never, you know, even remotely considered the possibility that anyone could not think this. So I had never talked about it to anybody. And it was only kind of by accident after meeting and marrying a biologist, someone who was actually already a fairly senior biologist, 19 years older than me, um, that I, you know, after a couple of years, began to vaguely realize that we were never talking about aging. And then when I started asking questions, discovering that she just wasn't interested in aging. She didn't think it was very important. And that nor did, neither did any of the other biologists that I was meeting. It was you know, a complete blind side to me. I had no idea of this until that moment. And it took another couple of years before I really came to terms with that discovery, you know, fully enough to realize that this left me no choice, that even though I was already working on a very important problem, namely the um, problem of artificial intelligence that, were, well, the solution that artificial intelligence gives to the problem of work, um, you know, nevertheless, this was obviously a much more important problem, and it was a problem in which I felt I had some chance of at least making some kind of contribution, and here I am. Now, I want to problematize this word aging, because I'm interested in your definition of aging, because you're very careful to say that you're not working on longevity, and this is not about immortality. Sorry to disappoint our audience, but this is not about immortality. It's about something more nuanced, isn't it? I think that the only reason this question constantly comes up is because of the media. Fact is, the, 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 the compulsion that so many people, that most people have to put aging out of their minds, ultimately manifests itself as a need to maintain some kind of emotional distance from the question of whether we can do anything about aging. So they kind of want to know, and that's why it's always in the media. But they don't want to take it too seriously or they'll get terribly invested in it and they'll worry about how soon it's going to happen and whether it's going to be in time for them and all that. So the kind of trivialization that comes from using words like immortality that kind of separate this from the language that we would normally use about technologically feasible things, that's, that, that terminology sells papers and that's why it's used all the time. But it absolutely does do huge damage because at the end of the day, we do need people to be emotionally invested in this in order to get the job done as fast as possible because, you know, we need people's support, we need people's money and so on, right? Um, so, I, yes, absolutely, I have to go to a huge amount of trouble to say, listen, for fuck's sake, boys and girls, we are not talking about longevity at all here, let alone immortality. Longevity will be a side effect of health. Yes, it will be a very welcome side effect, but the fact is the main focus is on stopping people from getting sick. And the reason that, that is not the focus that appears in the media at the end of the day is because it's not very interesting. We all kind of already know that we prefer to be healthy rather than sick and that we prefer everybody else to be healthy rather than sick, and you don't sell papers that way. So it's all about refocusing people from what they're told. Do you see this, I mean, you're often lumped in with a transhumanist community who see living longer as a human enhancement. Do, do you see what you're, doing, it, uh, what you're doing as a form of human enhancement? And if so, do you see it as a selective enhancement or do you see it as a therapeutic enhancement? In other words, will we choose to live longer or will this become something akin to a universal basic right to live longer? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you kind of make the first step in answering your own question by the use of the phrase therapeutic enhancement. Because really the fundamental answer to your question is that there is a very blurry line between the two things, between therapies and enhancements. And I certainly view this all as therapy. I view it as axiomatic, really, that the, um, that the restoration of, uh, to, to old people of a state that resembles how they were before and how, how younger people typically are is kind of by definition a therapy and not an enhancement. However, as you say, you know, it's kind of blurry. 
Whether it's a right or not, to me, is a different question, an unrelated question, well, an only tangentially related question. I believe absolutely that health is a human right, and the reason I believe that is simply because I see that it matters to people. I think that if we have any kind of objective manner in which to evaluate what is and is not a human right, then the answer must fundamentally reside in what matters to people. And people's health do, does matter to absolutely everybody. Well, let's talk about some of the methodologies on our way to defeat biological aging. So you have this foundation called the SENS Foundation, and you have a particular set of things on your roadmap for SENS. Could you share with us what those seven things are? Yeah, sure. So when I first arrived in this field, of course, I had to spend a few years really getting up to speed, learning all the, you know, what was what was known, what was not known, what was uncertain. And I was always looking out for some kind of overarching framework. And to be honest, I was a little disconcerted that this framework didn't already exist, you know, had not already been constructed. It was only during that period that I began to understand how gerontology, the study of the biology of aging, was suffering from the fact that it didn't have such a framework. Essentially, what that left it in was a situation where um, it was dominated by basic scientists, people who really are good at understanding and finding out how nature is, what the nature of nature, um, but who are absolutely awful at figuring out how to manipulate nature, how to do technology. Uh, and I'm you know, fundamentally a technologist. That's what I'm good at. I'm good at figuring out solutions. The mindset distinction, the difference of mindset between those two kinds of people is far larger than most people appreciate. You just use data, you use evidence in a completely different way. So, yeah, I, I came in and I decided, well, we need a framework. We need some kind of way to break down the problem into sub-problems and so on and so forth. And in the year 2000, when I realized that comprehensive damage repair, which was an idea that had never been considered within gerontology, would actually fly, the only reason I was able to do that at all was because immediately, literally that night when I started thinking about it, I saw how to fit together a bunch of strategies that I knew about that seemed to be realistic approaches to doing exactly this. Now, those strategies were mostly unknown to gerontologists because insofar as they, uh, the groundwork had been laid, it had been laid by scientific communities outside of gerontology, in one big case, even outside of medicine. So, you know, it was a big deal. But yes, I can certainly do that. So um, in the end, I came down to seven major categories. And these categories are categories of damage. So what do I mean by damage? I mean, I mean changes that the body inflicts upon itself throughout life as consequences, inherent, absolutely unavoidable consequences of its normal operation, and which are progressive, they accumulate. And the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of those kinds of changes, but eventually the body you know, is overwhelmed. Um, the, the, the changes exceed what the body is set up to, to handle, and that's when we get sick and eventually die. So those seven things are very concrete concepts like loss of cells, cells dying and not being automatically replaced by division of other cells, having too many cells because they're dividing when they're not supposed to, that's basically cancer, um, having too many cells because they're not dying when they are supposed to, which is something that people often overlook, but it's very important in, for example, the aging of the immune system. Then things that happen inside cells, the accumulation of waste products, which also happens outside cells. That's another category, a separate category. You may wonder how I decide what's one category and what's two. The fundamental basis for that is the therapies. The purpose of the classification of the taxonomy is to identify with each category a generic therapy, which may differ in the details for individual examples within the category, but the overall theme will be the same. So, for example, with cell loss, it's basically just stem cell therapy. We put cells into the body that we have pre-programmed into a state where they know what to do, to divide and differentiate, to replace the cells that the body is not replacing on its own. 
And of course, different tissues need different stem cell therapies, but all stem cell therapies have a great deal in common. It's the same across the board. Well, this is where you come into conflict with some of the scientific community because they say that SENS is a collection of hypotheses that cannot be scientifically verified, although the counter argument for that is that SENS has also not been conclusively disproved. Uh, do you think that the SENS Foundation is, is offering less scientific evidence and more hope to individuals? Do you think these are intriguing possibilities but we're still realizing that they may not actually be the seven that's going to drive the, the end of aging. <clears throat> right. So the kind of criticisms you mention are indeed characteristic, but they're not characteristic anymore. These are the kinds of things that my colleagues who study the biology of aging were inclined to say 10 or more years ago. And they really, you know, very egregiously exemplify and illustrate exactly what I was saying a couple of minutes ago about the difference between science and technology. Because the words that are used in these kinds of criticisms you know, very clearly incorporate the assumption that this is supposed to be science. In other words, it's supposed to be ways of finding out whether we age in this or that way. Well, in fact, it's not science at all. It's technology. It's medicine. You know, it's, it, it's not a hypothesis that we're testing. It's a plan that we're putting in place. And you may think, well, that's pretty obvious. So how come scientists are just making this category error? And the answer is because it's such a fundamental difference between the mindsets. You know, in science, you're trained to test hypotheses, to come up with ways to discriminate between different interpretations of how nature may actually be working. And there are particular techniques for doing that efficiently. In particular, you pay attention to the most directly relevant data. You, you, know, you, you, you design your hypotheses on that basis. You certainly do not engage in any kind of leap of faith. Whereas pioneering technology is all about leaps of faith. And, you know, I was kind of, you know, really surprised when I began to appreciate how fundamental this distinction is back in the early 2000s when I started talking about this stuff. And I remember writing in, I'm going to say 2003, in some paper where I first started getting really angry about all of this. I said, listen, for fuck's sake, I didn't quite say it that way. Um, um, you know, if we left powered flight to scientists, then obviously we'd, we would still be trying to fly by flapping because that's the evidence. That's what we see as the pre-existing you know, way, that, way that it's done. You needed the leap of faith that involved saying, okay, we've got this concept of you know, aerodynamics and so on, and that, that concept and so on, and putting all of these things together and putting two and two together and making 17 is what all pioneering technology is about. And yet basic scientists just totally don't get it. They totally don't believe that this is a valid way of thinking. So it has taken me, as you rightly point out, a long time to dispel that. But the great news is that that has happened. You know, I have been beating my colleagues over the head for a long time now, and, I, and I'm not the only one. You know, over time, it has become so obvious that what I'm saying does make sense, that my colleagues have taken the trouble to actually study it and understand it. And there is only a very small minority now of experts within the gerontology community who are still in this unreconstructed mode of, you know, saying things like what you quoted. Most people basically get it. And in fact, it's better than that. Actually, you know, there are now quite a few cases turning up where people are reinventing the exact same concept and pretending it's their own idea. Uh, which, you know, I would prefer to get more of the credit, you understand, but I honestly don't care. What matters is that these people are being listened to. Now, Aubrey, you're someone who's not afraid to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to making certain predictions, but I've always found something typically convenient, let's just say, about your predictions. So you've claimed uh, fairly recently that therapies which can add 30 healthy years to the remaining lifespan of a typical 60-year-old may well arrive in the next few decades. Now, if you don't mind me sharing with this audience, you're 50 years old. Is there a reason why these predictions fall within your lifespan? 
Well, of course, I am not the first person to be the butt of that accusation. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just, no, it's not. It honestly isn't. It's, I tell it how I see it. And certainly, you know, things have slipped a little bit. Um, I'm gratified to say that the only reason why the time frames of Chef have slipped over the past decade or more since I started making predictions is because of lack of money. Uh, that we've moved less less rapidly than we could have done because of the lack of funding. And we have not, by contrast, come across any new unexpected obstacles that made it, the problem look harder than it would. So we have made progress. Um, yeah, so no, it's not all about me. Well, you know, could, could, uh, 10 could, years ago, people said, oh, it's all about my wife because she's 19 years older than me and so on. It wasn't about her either. I mean, was, was that a... a Slight on the fact that maybe you can extend your own genome through children, per se? Yeah, that... screw my genome. I could perfectly well have kids if I want to, but I don't. Well, <laughs> we, might, we might go back to that later. I, 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 but I do want to touch on a, on a, uh, rather than getting personal, I do want to touch on a, a, a point you just made with regards to some of those uh, predictions and breakthroughs. Have there been any breakthroughs or innovations in regenerative medicine currently in the last, say, let's five years, which kind of prove out your thesis. I first met you in, I think, about 2010. It's, it's now 2017. I mean, what has happened in the last seven years? Or, or are you going to go and say, look, nothing because I don't have enough money for SENS Foundation? Well, I could say that, <laughs> but I will make a more, perhaps more acceptable statement, which Thank is you. that we don't work on things that are close enough to fruition to reach what one could legitimately call proof within as little as seven years. When something is that close to true fruition, it's no longer our problem. Stem cell therapy is a great example. I already mentioned stem cell therapy as a, a, an absolutely you know, vital, intrinsic part of the sense panel. We hardly do anything in that area. And the reason we don't is because other people are doing it with perfectly good money from other places because that field has become sufficiently accepted and legitimized that it doesn't need us. The work that we do has been very much focused, by contrast, on the most difficult areas, which, because they're the most difficult, have been the most neglected. Not necessarily the ones in which there is no expertise. In fact, that's never the case but rather the ones in which people, you know, they might try something briefly, but eventually they come up against the hard reality that they need to get tenure or they need to get promoted or they need to get their next grant application or they need to get their PhD students um, out to their postdoctoral fellowships. And those things all require publications and they require them quickly. And it doesn't therefore matter whether people work on the most significant and important things. What matters is they work on the low, low enough hanging fruit to be able to get those publications in high profile journals and so on. So we work on the really hard stuff. And over the past few years, we have indeed been getting more and more publications in really high profile journals, but only after projects that we have been funding have progressed for five or 10 years in some cases, which is it, impossible in traditional academia. I want to talk a little bit more about that, that issue of the predictions making the reality on the ground, because it's not just the, the issue of publication. It's the fact that when it comes to, let's just call it longevity medicine, the time frame from getting something from the lab onto the market could massively negate some of your predictions. It may take 10 years from the discovery to turn it into a drug that's actually available on the market. My, my question is, is partly how do we solve that? And also, do you think that countries like China may beat America and the rest of the Western world to this ability to allow us to have longevity medicine it's a very, available? It's a very important question. A large part of why I take a lot of time to speak to audiences that may not necessarily be biologists or whatever, or enthusiasts, is precisely to address that, to get um, policy makers, opinion formers, you know, decision makers, better informed about the priorities here, the, what's, what's, what the options are and what may happen. I personally believe that the time frame for the true 100% achievement of the technologies that we're working on 
is around 20 years, with, of course, a wide range of speculation around that. So 50 50 chance of getting there around 20 years from now. But the time frame that people in decision making and, inf and opinion forming positions need to be thinking about is absolutely not that time frame. What they need to be thinking about is the time frame within which there is going to be a change in widespread anticipation of these technologies. Specifically, I think, and I have always said this, I think that within well under a decade, perhaps as little as five years, there is very likely to be a sufficient level of progress in the laboratory, mostly in mice, in terms of postponing aging with rejuvenation therapies, that even my more conservative colleagues who have reputations to lose will be going out there on stage and on camera and saying, well, in as many words, they'll be saying, yes, Aubrey de Grey was right all along. But what they'll actually be saying is, um, what they'll actually be saying is, yeah, you know, it's only a matter of time before we get this rejuvenation thing to actually work for humans, because we have seen enough in the lab to show that it is practical. Now, I have always said, and I maintain even more strongly now than ever, that the sequence of events thereafter, from that point onwards, will be very, very rapid. That basically, you know, the day after that kind of thing happens, the Oprah Winfrey's of this world will be out there saying, well, if it's only a matter of time, then maybe it might be a good idea to make it a little less time. And the day after that, it will become impossible to get elected unless you have a manifesto commitment to have a real war on aging, not just a war on cancer scale war on aging, but an actual, you know, ridiculous amount of investment, not only in getting these therapies developed as quickly as the science allows, but also in putting in place the infrastructure, you know, the training of medical personnel and the building of, you know, uh, whatever it's whatever's necessary, so that this therapy can be provided to everybody who's old enough to need it, pretty much as soon as it's developed. I believe that the anticipation of that anticipation, if you see what I mean, is utterly critical at this point in order to minimize the turbulence that will arise as a result of these, these, these breakthroughs. I want to ask you about some of the other possibilities for ending aging very, very quickly. And the, the first being Google Calico. So Google threw money and their name into the ring that they employ your friend Ray Kurzweil. I, I wonder why they didn't come knocking at your door to give you a, a job at Google. You may well. Google Calico. You may well wonder. I wonder too. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, so first of all, um, to give him his due, Ray, uh, yes, I know him well, of course, but he doesn't work at Calico. No, I know that. He, he works in the work, AI. Yeah, he only yeah. works on, actually, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, he works mainly in natural language um, uh, understanding. Uh, though he was involved, shortly after he arrived at Google, in the initial plan for Calico. He got together with the guy who was at that point running Google Ventures, a guy named Bill Maris, and they formulated the first plan. And the word has it that what happened was they took it to Larry and Sergey, and Larry said, well, sounds great. Let's do it internally. Let's not, because originally it was going to be part of Google Ventures. It was going to be a spin out, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, they said, let's do it internally. And they thought, thought about that for a while, and they decided, okay, the way we're going to do it is we're going to hire the world's best biotech CEO, and we're going to take it from there. And they knew who the world's best biotech CEO was because he was already on their board, as well as being on the board of Apple, namely Art Levinson, who used to run Genentech. And after a bit of work, in fact, quite a lot of work, if I understand it, um, they got him. Uh, apparently, part of the negotiation went as follows. Art said, what's my budget going to be? Right. And Larry said, we'll tell you when we run out of money. Um, <clears throat> that's the rumor. Um, <laughs> um, However, the thing is, Art is a smart guy. He doesn't just know what he knows. He also knows what he doesn't know. And he took a job to do something that he doesn't know. But he took it. So he thought, oh dear, what do I do now? And what he did was he bifurcated the activities of Calico into a part that was essentially 
doing exactly what he knows how to do. You know, essentially kind of, essentially genetic Mark II. Um, so doing you know, other deals with Big Pharma and so on. And, you know, generally, you know, nice high profile thing. And then uh, he thought to himself, well, okay, I've created this nice insulation and I can get on with my actual remit without people really paying much attention. Uh, but I don't know what to do. Unfortunately, that was where the problem began. He also didn't know whom to hire who did know what to do. So what he did was he thought, mm, I, think I, ought, I think I need a basic scientist here. Wrong answer. So he hired a basic scientist. I mean a seriously basic, basic scientist. Yeah. He hired an old friend of his named David Botstein as chief science officer. David, Bo I mean, let me explain exactly how bad a decision that was. David Botstein is on record, was on record already, as saying he doesn't have a translational bone in his body. I mean, and you're hiring this guy to develop new technology. I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, that's exactly how it has turned out. I mean, of course, Calico are very secretive, as is typical for any company that doesn't need money, right? But, and so I don't blame them for being secretive. But the fact is, um, you know, you can tell a fair amount about what they're doing from whom they hire. Plus, also, we get the odd rumor, you know, one of my people met one of their people on the train and you know, things like that. Um, <clears throat> but, um, so basically, yeah, long, long, and short, long and short of it is, they are completely throwing the money down the drain. The fact that Calico exists is fantastic because it, afford, it, it confers a huge amount of credibility on the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But the, what, what Calico are doing is a fucking tragedy, and I am utterly appalled. And I'm even more appalled because Larry and Sergey themselves have no excuse. They've both known me for 15 years. I mean, I haven't seen them for at least five or eight years, but the fact is... They know all about what we do, and they have just chosen to blow us off. And they are costing a lot of lives as a result. Well, you, you heard it here first at Virtual Futures. Immortality will not be provided or powered by Google. So let's ask about some more friends of yours. Ray Kurzweil, his pill popping, and Peter, Peter Till's supposed, uh, supposed, and it is, it is still a rumor, his supposed efforts in blood transfusion, otherwise known as parabiosis, where, um, as the press has, has run with it, said that he's taking the blood of teenagers and pumping those through his veins. What do you think, more seriously, what do you actually think of things like parabiosis and what Ray's doing with yeah, okay, popping 250 pills a day? Are these good methodologies towards what you're trying to achieve, or are these doing exactly the opposite? Uh, I'll start with Ray. So... Um Ray, as most of you probably know, uh, is um, you know, his main history is in IT. He's made very he's made plenty of successes in terms of inventions in in tech. Uh, but over the past decade or so, he's got a lot of interest in the aging space, and he's written a number of books in this area. Um, the the fundamental theme that he has pursued is very similar to mine in the sense of building a, uh, an incremental building process, which he calls bridges and he he identifies three bridges there's what we can do now which is called bridge one there's what we can do with biotech in the foreseeable future which is bridge two and then there's essentially the non-biological stuff uploading nanotech and so on which is bridge three now bridge two is pretty much identically my stuff so he and i are 100 percent shoulder to shoulder on that fundamental good bridge three we're also pretty much shoulder to shoulder i don't consider myself in any way an expert in those areas, but I pay a bit of attention. I appreciate that these things are not nearly so sci-fi as, as m m many people would have us believe, and so maybe they're possible. And in particular, I'm going to sneeze. Hang on. Um, um, okay. um, uh, um, in, in particular, I certainly believe that um, it's worth... <coughs> there we go. Uh, <laughs> Logos, my speakers. Aubrey de Grey has a cold, and uh, you better better get that checked out because uh, you know it can be serious this time, of, terminal up. even this time of year. Shut up. <laughs> um, um, uh, those worth pursuing these things. Um, my real, my only real departure from Ray in terms of Bridge Three is that I'm not at all sure that the motivation to go in that direction will really survive after we get the biotech stuff working, the Bridge Two stuff. 
So my main interest in bridge three is that it may actually turn out that bridge two is a lot harder than I think, and therefore we need bridge three instead rather than as well. And um, vampirically taking teenage but, so blood. Then, yeah, I'm coming that back. one. Hang on, hang on, you get them. Hang on, you get them. Hang on, hang on, hang on. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah. So back to bridge one. Bridge one is an area where Ray and I do definitely differ, and yeah, where I feel you know basically what we can do now does very little for most people, and can do very little for most people. Um, I believe that Ray has been overly seduced by his own personal experience. And the reason I say that is because Ray himself, this is well known, this is public knowledge, Ray himself drew a bunch of short straws health-wise. He has a lot of cardiovascular disease in his family. He came down with type 2 diabetes in his 30s, which is, you know, it's not unheard of, but it's pretty rare. And, um, you know, there is plenty of evidence that if you have seriously drawn some short straws, then there are things that you can do with today's medicine that will substantially normalize that simply because the, the straws that you've drawn only cover a very small subset of what aging really is, even if fundamentally they are the same processes. So I am kind of you know, impressed with and not surprised by the fact that Ray has succeeded in bringing his own health condition so well under control. He's in his late 60s now, and as I understand it, he still has no sign of diabetes whatsoever. But I feel that it is absolutely not valid to extrapolate that to the general case to people who are doing all uh, averagely well already let alone people like myself who are doing unusually well so that's that's the difference between us. okay so that's my ray answer um my parabiosis answer well yes so as you say there is this rumor i have a feeling that peter slightly enjoys the rumor um uh, i mean i don't see peter very much you understand he's a very busy guy but um but yeah um it's the kind of thing that kind of fits his persona I think it's extremely unlikely that anything like that is actually happening. Um, the science behind it. So it, the, the rumor comes from the fact that apparently someone at Till Capital phoned Ambrosia, who are doing uh, arguably parabiosis. Uh, let's put Peter aside for a second, but actually talk about that process. Right, is there okay. any scientific proof there? Okay, so let's go, let's, let's go through the league table. So the original work that started back about 10 or 12 years ago now that got everyone's attention was bona fide parabiosis, where you take an old animal and a young animal and you actually join their circulatory systems together. And sure enough, the older animal is, uh, the, the older animal does benefit. The younger animal is not terribly happy. Um, um, and um, yeah, so that's, that, that's all good. So then the question is, what really is going on? You know, what are the active ingredients? Is that the, the, the old animal has bad stuff in their blood that they're less good at clearing than the young animal is? Is it that the young animal has good stuff in their blood that the, anim the older animal is making less of? We don't even know that. You know, research, different researchers have different opinions on that. I mean, after 10 years, it's, it turns out it's a much harder question to answer than you would hope, let alone the real question we want to answer, which is what are the active ingredients? So there are half a dozen things out there that people have identified as potential active ingredients, but there's controversy about pretty much all of them. Um, so this is a very, very fertile, active, living research field, and it will remain so for a while. But in the meantime, what do we do? So we funded some work in one of the top parabiosis labs at Berkeley, which looked at the simple question, okay, if you, rather than doing parabiosis, if you do an exchange of plasma, so plasma, first of all, what's that? It's simply blood minus the cells, right? And then exchange obviously means you take out the old person, you know, you put in new stuff. Um, so we did that, and we asked, you know, can we recapitulate the kind of rejuvenating benefits that we get? If you could, that's big news, because, of course, first of all, you know, you can do it with multiple young individuals' plasma rather than just one person being connected, right? Um, second of all, um, we were uh, we actually did the the way we did the experiment was we just did a one-off, one exchange, and we asked like three months later or whenever it was, you know, what's the benefit? So that's pretty cool, and it turned out yes that most of the benefits that were given by bona fide parabiosis were indeed recapitulated. So that's very great. But then we want to go further, of course. We want to know what the individual ingredients are. What Ambrosia are doing, however, is a very poor man's version of that. I mean, I say poor, they, they charge 8K for it, you understand. But, um, but um, what they do is plasma transfusion. In other words, they put in some young plasma, but they don't take any of your plasma out. So, of course, that means you can only put a very small amount in, because otherwise the person would explode. 
right? Which would be kind of bad. Um, so, um, so uh, it's very curious why there would be any effects at all. There do seem to be some effects. Not least, it's not just Ambrosia. There's another company named Alcahest that are doing a very legitimate, very, um, you know, um, by the book, clinical trial for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and they're doing the same thing, plasma transfusion. And they, they appear to be getting some effects, though it's very modest. Um, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, early days. So the wonderful thing about the Virtual Futures audience is that it's multi-generational. So if you're under 25, you want to pair up with someone over 50 in the bar afterwards, we can all live forever. I'm over 50. You can have my beer. Uh, <laughs> Aubrey will buy you a beer. No, no, you... I won't buy you a beer. I'll transfuse you my beer. You can have my beer in exchange. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't want to ask about the science behind that. The one thing I do want to go into, though, is, look, if all of this doesn't work, it does it pay to back the backups? So, again, are the friends of yours, Max Moore, with the Chronics Institute and also the, the folks at Oxford, the, uh, the, the Future Humanity Institute, who are advocating for whole brain emulation, mind uploading, the idea of placing your brain into a computer. Very quickly, Aubrey, where do you stand on those two forms of backing up individuals? So the whole universe of uploading options, whether it's mind files, whether it's bona fide uploading, you know, all of these things are still very, very early in terms of even describing how they would be done, let alone implementing them. And I think it's too early to have an opinion. Cryonics, on the other hand, completely different situation. Cryonics is moving forward very well now. In fact, one of our spin-outs is pursuing and pioneering, I would, I'm going to say, the single most important technology in that whole space right now. Is that the revival piece, or is that... The cryopreservation piece. So, See, here's the as, problem. Oh, oh, Why is nobody working on bringing these people back? It feels like the, the world's best pyramid scheme. You give the money, and then the clients can't complain against fraud because they're dead already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, the loved ones of the clients may not be dead, but the um, <laughs> well, they argue they're not dead. But, but, <laughs> the, but the key thing, the key thing is that we all know how much damage cryopreservation does as of today. It's been twenty years since the breakthrough development of true bona fide vitrification, mm -hmm. where the crystallization that happens when you freeze biological tissue was eliminated. But that still left two huge problems. Number one, the problem of the toxicity of the cryoprotectants. These are very, very non-toxic um, compounds, but nevertheless, you have to use them in such high concentrations that it's a really big deal. Mm -hmm. Secondly, cracking, frac just large-scale fractures that just break the whole, whole tissue apart. And of course, this applies to cryonics. It also applies to organ cryopreservation, which would be a wonderful thing to be able to do. Um, the company that I'm talking about, Aragos, A-R-I-G-O-S, which is run by the person who used to be our chief operating officer, uh, is pioneering a technology called persuflation, P-E-R-S-U-F-F-lation, that is as far as we can tell, a complete solution. Well, as good as complete to both of these problems. If it works even half as well as it looks as though it works, then we are talking about a situation in which the damage done to organs or indeed whole bodies by the cryopreservation process can be more or less neglected as, as compared to the damage that had already occurred in the person, otherwise they wouldn't already be dead, right? Um, so I believe that no, at this point, cryonics is a real thing, and it needs much more support. Just in the same way that our work needs more support, we absolutely very, very badly need cryonics to be more legitimized. Well, let's go back. Let's go back to the work you're doing at Sense Foundation and do and do the wonderful things that you love doing at every discussion, which is the philosophical, societal, and cultural issues, which is something that always comes up. So let's very quickly. I'm in, I'm in Britain now. I, I I'm back in the country where they have this thing called sarcasm. Okay. Uh, well, that and, and, and Brexit. So quite frankly, living forever is kind of low on the agenda. But um, look, uh, you dismiss the idea that life is given meaning through death. Why? Let's just, it, let's just run through these really quick. Aubrey. Because it's bullshit. <laughs> just, all right, I'm going to say mean, that. It, it has zero semantic content, right? I mean, there is nothing there. Uh-huh. All right, well, there's a counter-argument for that. But look, um, isn't there a religious or 
theological argument for what you are arguing. Is, isn't oh, this, this whole idea yeah, just, yeah, uh, just an extension of Judo-Christian religion? Instead yeah, of, of course, yeah. going yeah. up to the to the clouds to see the big guy in the sky, we just get to continue our life on this planet. This is the rational response to a to a post theist world. Yeah, yeah, that's bullshit too. But for a but for a much better reason. Can you explain why? Yeah, sure. Namely that. We're not supposed to commit suicide. We're not supposed to kill each other, right? So the Holy Scripture is perfectly clear about this. We're supposed to let God decide when we go there, right? And um, you know, if we fix our health, that's you know, last I last I checked, God was supposed to be omnipotent, which means that He can perfectly well strike anyone down with a thunderbolt, however healthy they are. Whereas conversely, one thing that is very clear in all Holy Scriptures is that. What we're supposed to be doing down here is minimizing suffering. And it's unequivocally clear that aging causes far more suffering than anything else in today's world. Therefore, ergo, by one's own definition, namely what's written down in Holy Scripture, it would be a sin not to be working to eliminate aging. All right, let's do this classic one. Wouldn't living forever be boring? Or do you believe in what Max Moore is kind of arguing, which is, look, let's just reinvent ourselves every 80 years ad infinitum? We're reinventing ourselves all the time. You know, we forget things a lot, but we forget the things that we don't care about. I absolutely can only remember the names of less than half of the people I went to high school with. And that doesn't bother me in the slightest. Whereas conversely, I know perfectly well that, you know, 50 years from now, there's a fair, fair chance that I will meet people that I haven't met for 50 years, and they will be completely different people, and it will be just as much fun as it would have been if they were exactly the same person as they had been the previous time I met them. I want to go back a little bit to what you said about suicide. So what strikes me about your mission is if you give people the option to live indefinitely, then you also at the same time have to advocate for things like euthanasia. You have to give them the option of when they want to leave this planet. Or as some science fiction writers have argued, what we do is we do surprise suicide parties where their friends will get together and kill them um, by surprise to, to give back that element of surprise around death. Now, where do you stand? Don't you believe that, that at least ethically, you should also be advocating for euthanasia at the same time that you advocate for longevity? All right. So, um, first of all, euthanasia, in case you hadn't noticed, is the, the discussion around euthanasia almost entirely revolves around the choice to die of people whose quality of life is not only really low, but has no realistic prospect of ever, ever returning to, to good health. That is not the question that we are discussing here, because we're talking about longevity as a side effect of good health. So then the question is, well, okay, supposing, however, that even if people are in good physical and mental health, nevertheless, they get so sick of life that uh -huh. they still want to die. Now, we it's been have 200 years of Brexit and Trump. You know what? I'm out this month. So today we have the concept of suicide. It happens. People get that way. And, you know, people's loved ones don't get prosecuted for the fact that their loved ones committed suicide. But more to the point, we try to change their minds. And the, re the reason we try to change their minds is not because we think they haven't had enough of a good life yet. The reason we try to change their minds is because we think they can have a good life going forward. Now, I've never rung the Samaritans, but I'm pretty bloody sure that if you do, then the first question they ask you is not your date of birth, so that they can put the phone down if you're over 80. You know, it's just not like that. We, 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 we care about people's lives, irrespective of how long ago they were born. And I don't see that changing. Let's do another fun one. Overpopulation. This is the one you get asked all the time. Aren't we already overburdened by people? Um, won't we have too many people? And look, your counter argument is that you perceive that technology is going to increase the carrying capacity of the planet. Could you just explain Very good. your you argument for why overpopulation is, is 
bollocks as well. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, um, of course, there are other reasons why it's bollocks. You know, <laughs> the fact that um, the fact that you know, fertility rates are plummeting, and people will have fewer kids or le- have their kids less frequently when they know they're going to live a long time, and so on. But yes, the advance of other technologies is the main uh, is the strongest answer in my view. The fact is, there is no such thing as overpopulation in an absolute sense. What we mean when we say that there are too many people on the planet is that the number of people on the planet is such that the environment is suffering. And that is because, not of the people, but because of the pollution generated by the people. So clearly, the more we can reduce that pollution, the less overpopulation we have. And if we look at what that pollution consists of, of course, it's obvious, right? Climate change, big deal right now. It comes from the fact that we burn all this bloody fossil fuel. And the reason we burn it is because we're not very good at renewable energy yet. But we're getting better all the time. Even better than that, we're not getting better because we care about climate change. We're getting better because it turns out that we can make solar energy, for example, more cheaply if we just work a little bit more than we can fossil fuels. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that happens across the board, whether it's artificial meat, whether it's, you know, desalination, all of these things are coming really fast, way before the technology that I work on has had any impact, or even probably before it's even been developed, we're going to have a world in which the carrying capacity of the planet, in other words, the number of people we can have on the planet with an acceptable level of environmental impact, will be going up far faster than the actual population of the planet could go up, even in the complete absence of all death. This one's everybody's favourite, Aubrey. What about the inequality of access? Will you only be given the innovations that SENS Foundation creates to the rich people at Silicon Valley, or how will the rest of us get access yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah, my favourite, my favourite, in terms of you know, my jaded view of all this bullshit, is, <laughs> is that... The same fucking people in the in consecutive breaths will voice the overpopulation objection and also the inequality of access objection. Completely not understanding. I mean, these are people with IQs more than ten, right? People just not seeing that these things are mutually exclusive. You know that you can't have overpopulation if only a few people are getting the fucking. Of course, Aubrey, because I mean, all the rich people will be on Elon Musk's plane to Mars, living forever on that planet, and not this one. But so it should they, be fine. Even if they're down here, there's only a few of them, and they can only have a finite number. Of, yeah. Um, so, so anyway. But to that question, the inequality of access, yeah, right. look, so is this thing actually going to have trickle-down economics? Mm-hmm. Is, is part of it, are we going to see trickle-down with regards to this technology, or is it always going to be the privileges it, 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 of certain It's very members? important, but it's much better than trickle-down. It's not just a case of, yeah, you know, iPhones will get cheaper. You know, it's, I mean, that will certainly happen, but the point is, even when these technologies first come along and they're really pretty expensive to develop and to deliver, nevertheless, that expense will still pale into insignificance relative to the savings, the amount of money that the economy will benefit from in terms of the um, avoidance of all the medical care we currently have to provide to people who are sick because people won't be getting sick and also of course the indirect cost the fact that the kids of the elderly will be so much more productive because they won't be looking after their sick parents the fact that the elderly themselves will be still contributing wealth to society all of these things will I mean however you look at it it irrespective of what particular structure the society has you know how capitalist it is how you know what, uh, how tax friendly it is all of these things will be completely irrelevant in any country. It will be completely, econ- even ignoring the humanitarian imperative entirely, it will be utterly economically mandated. You'll go bankrupt if you don't do it. And of course, people don't see this because what their natural impression I- uh, inclination is, is to think that the right precedent to look at is today's high-tech medicine. But it isn't. And the reason it isn't is because today's high-tech medicine, which is, of course, overwhelmingly for the elderly, uh, in case you hadn't noticed, it doesn't work. We just end up spending a lot of money, and the people get sick anyway, or not long after they would have otherwise done, and you end up spending the same amount of money as you otherwise would have done. So the economic arithmetic is negative. That simply isn't going to be the case when the medicine does work. So the only precedent that we can look at right now, and it's not perfect, but it's a pretty good one, is 
basic education. Even in a you know, a pulse, repulsively tax averse society like the USA, basic education is free. I mean, pretty basic, yes, but it's free. And the reason it's free is this reason that if you don't do that, then 20 years down the road, you're going to be bankrupt because your know, workforce isn't going to know what to do. The last one, Aubrey, affects your industry specifically. So quite famously, the, the physicist Max Planck said that science advances one funeral at a time. And similarly, Thomas Kuhn argued in Structure of the Scientific Revolutions that revolutionary progress only happens when generations die. In other words, the death of one generation is essential for progress to occur. In actual fact, in this whole field, it only may advance if some generations die and new thinking comes into it. So how... Oh, we, to we totally need turnover of thinking. The question is whether we need turnover of individuals. So, I mean, look, I have become a world leader in the field of gerontology. But if I hadn't met the right woman at the right time, I would probably still be an artificial intelligence researcher. And when I was, I was very much a proponent of what used to be called good old-fashioned AI, the symbolic approach to figuring out how, computer, how to get computers to be smarter than us just by getting them to understand, to do what they do well, to do logic. Now, as of today, we see that the enormous, I mean, just breathtaking breakthroughs that are being made are as a result of the successes that have occurred in the competing paradigm, the neural net kind of paradigm. I might very well have, you know, impeded that if I had stayed in AI. I could easily have ended up, as of today, being just as prominent in AI as I am in gerontology today. And I might have been a fossil, the dinosaur getting in the way. AI is big right now. Uh, you, you could have done a very good speaking career with AI, Aubrey. I'm sure you would have been lining up with them. I don't know. Max take mark. And, I, don't, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, I'd like to think that I would have been open minded enough, but I don't know. So I believe that changes of career are very important, and that's not going to change. But it sure as hell doesn't mean people have to die. Or well, more, more importantly, then. So if we look at just genetic imperative, we have the same sorts of genetically non-diverse people populating this planet. Are we going to leave ourselves exposed if we really race towards a post-Darwinist? ideal whereby we don't pass genes onto generations and allow for for new generations to emerge are we going to end up in a situation where one virus is going to wipe us all out because it's been the same sort of genetics on this earth for a heck of a long time so first thing when people don't have when there's no turnover at all in the extreme example of what you're saying where there's just no death and no birth which of course is not going to be the actual situation but let's just take that as the you know the extreme then it's not as if the genetic diversity of the species diminishes, it just stays the same, right? So still, we're in no, we're no greater danger of some pandemic wiping us all out in one go than we are today. Secondly, we're going to care rather a lot more. One of the absolute scandals of today's society is the pitiful amount of money that is spent on vaccine research. And the reason there's so pitiful an amount is, number one, it doesn't make money. Number two, in a sense, the reason why it doesn't make money is that hardly anybody in government in the West dies of pandemics. Now, we, we, um, hardly anybody has HIV, as far as we know, right, uh, in, in government, right? Um, whereas everybody has aging. So I don't think we're going to have that problem. I think people are going to be very keen to work much harder than we can today to prevent, you know, to preempt, to anticipate any of those kinds of problems. And it's not as if the technology is not there. We can totally do that. I suppose my, my final concern, Aubrey, is we already have radical life extending technologies and these are called sanitation they're called education they're called regulation they're called contraception they're called universal health care they're called clean water participatory economics and participatory political systems instead of talking about fictional potential future technologies should we actually be putting our attention towards these things to ensure our future. So since you said that that's your last question, I want to preface my answer by congratulating you on answering, on asking all these questions as if you actually didn't know the answers. It was very good. <laughs> um, um, and since I was so insulting at the beginning, I thought I was... We're trying to create a performance, Aubrey. We're trying to... So... 
But look, answer me on that one. I'm, well, I'm, why aren't we, why aren't we focused I'm, on the things I'm, actually fucking matter today as I, opposed I, to this I, fictional I, um, technology and so, mind uploading and all this right, stuff that right. may or may not happen? Yeah, right. So, so I am... Um, you know, I often get asked, why don't you write to Bill Gates and get money? You know, he's technically aware, he must understand the value of all this and so on. And the fact is, I don't want Bill Gates' money. The reason I don't want his money is because he's gone out there and he's made perfectly clear that his personal priority is to spend his money on the disadvantaged, on the people in sub-Saharan Africa who don't have mosquito nets and so on and so forth. And I am fine with that. I believe that it's absolutely essential for us to do everything we can to improve the quality of life, the standard of living and everything of the trailing edge of humanity. The only thing I say is that, thank God, there are also people like Peter Thiel who feel that it's also important to push forward the leading edge of humanity. Because at the end of the day, if you only push the trailing edge, eventually it's going to butt up against the leading edge and everyone's stuck. So for me, you have to do both. And it's not as if there's any real zero-sum game there. The fact is, you know, different problems exist in the two cases. Different people are positioned to do something about them. Different expertise is involved. So it's absolutely not the case that we have to choose. I just worry that talking about ending aging is a is a very privileged position. And that, that's a good point on which to open this up to audience questions. And we have a very busy room and a, and a very um, wonderful mic runner who's going to have to oh, do, do, have some, runner, that's do some incredible ballet to be able to get this microphone through the audience. You can always so throw it. I am going to go with the first question just here to make your life easy. And then uh, I'll let you jump through the back. Hello. Hello. Oh, Hi, thank you for that. That was uh, wonderful and inspiring. Um, and thank you, Luke, for uh, your your great hosting. Um, I just my big I I I'm I'm with you one hundred percent. For me, I I I don't think it's an if. I think it's a when. But my big concern is with mental health. I think that uh, is once we do extend life expectancy, I think we're going to have an influx of mental health issues depression, neurosis, psychosis. I think it's going to open a new wave of uh, uh, conditions. I mean, I, I, All right, first question I have for you is, why do you think that? What's the basis of that apprehension of yours? Why do I think that? Uh, why do I, like the individual? Yeah, self, you. Yeah, why do you so think the, that? The, are you a professional psychologist? I mean, what are you? I'm not a professional All right, psychologist. So what so, gives you hold, hold on a sec. I mean, let's, uh, I mean, this is something, this is not. Why do you not think that? Because there's no reason to think it. But, but Aubrey, I think, I think what Luke's arguing is, is the fact that people deal with more and more anxiety every single day because of the ways in which they're living their lives. If we assume that the world is going to be a lot like it is today, are we going to have the same sorts of uh, issues that cause the, the influx of things like depression or anxiety if we all don't right, fix all right, those? All right, all right. The best answer I can give is... Can I just actually finish what I was going to say because you just went straight in and uh, this is with no disrespect... But you focus so much on the external aspects of prolonging life, but you're not focused on the the internal aspects. I do get it. I do get it. I do get what you're saying. Okay, so of course there are linkages between the external and the internal. You know, one's satisfaction with one's life is very significantly influenced by one's health and by one's expectation of one's future health. So I don't think one can really disconnect them. However, to disconnect them temporarily, uh, uh, to, to look at the, the distinct parts, I think the fundamental thing that we always have to take into account when we think about the way in which an individual or society in general will respond to the increasing longevity of society is that it will happen gradually. That we will only get older at one year per year. There won't be any thousand-year-old people for another 900 years, whatever happens. And, yeah, that's a lot of time to figure out what to do. So I absolutely believe that we need to be alive to the possibility that increasing lifespans will you know, throw out new problems, new psychological problems included, and perhaps those are the most important ones. But I do not believe that those problems will emerge, bang, like that, and suddenly we will have some tragedy. I believe that the only realistic scenario, if those problems were to occur at all, is that they will emerge very gradually, 
we will see them emerging and we will figure out what to do as they happen. Just keep your fingers crossed. Um, question just at the back here. Hi. Um, some of your uh, counter arguments to the concerns and stuff such like that. Uh, Raise your hand, I can't see you. Right okay, here. got you. Some of your counter arguments to people's concerns about stuff like overpopulation and stuff um, rely on uh, your kind of quite optimistic predictions of what consequences future advances will have on the Earth's carrying capacity and, and future societies. Are you, what, what are you basing these, these predictions on? Yeah, right, good question. And good question. Is there a quantifiable so, uh, amount? Or? Let me start there. So, first of all, you say that my predictions are optimistic. But what do you mean? Do you mean over-optimistic? No, or just optimistic. Well, this is it, you see. When people say optimistic, what they really mean is over-optimistic. When people say realistic, what they really mean is pessimistic. So, um, <clears throat> so Welcome to England. Quite. Um, um, so, um, so, 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 so it's important to actually come up with as objective a probabilistic scenario, uh, uh, understanding as one can. You know, what is actually likely to happen? And, you know, when I say that these things are blindingly likely, you know, vanishing unlikely not to happen in time for everything. I'm getting that from the current rate of progress. I believe I'm, you know, evaluating data objectively. However, let's also bear in mind that even if I'm wrong, we have a couple of rather important, shall we say, backstop, backup arguments. The first one is this. Supposing that we actually fail to develop the, sufficient, the, the necessary technologies or societal changes or whatever to preempt this or that concern of the kind that is typically raised today. Whether it's overpopulation, whether it's inequality of access, whether it's dictators living forever, whatever it is. Supposing that would happen. Then what we have to ask ourselves is, how bad would that problem be in that worst case scenario? And we have to compare our perceived severity of that problem with the severity of the problem that we are solving and whose solution would be causing the new problem. So, you know, how bad is aging right now? We're very good at putting it out of our minds, but is that relevant? You know, the fact is, aging kills 110,000 people worldwide every fucking day. And it doesn't just kill them. You've got to obviously take into account all the suffering that goes before, all the decline and disease and de dependence and decrepitude and gen general misery, you know, that goes with all that. Seems pretty bad to me. So if we were faced with a scenario in which, just to take over population as an example, if we were faced with a scenario in which we had not developed enough technology to increase the carrying capacity of the planet, and we did have a really serious climate change situation, for example, and we had to choose between, on the one hand, having fewer kids than we would like going forward, or on the other hand, uh, everyone getting Alzheimer's and cancer and all the things we get today. Realistically, what, do you, what would you choose? I mean, come on. Well, I'm talk you are people, you see. That's why I said that. I, I, I'm saying, what would people choose? Now, um, of course, one might have to you know, impose some kind of restriction on people's choices in the way that China did, you know, for wrong reasons earlier on and so on. But the fact is, it's a choice. It's a choice that we can make. And we have to ask ourselves today, would the choice be so bad as the situation today? Very good. So then the next... Right. So, of course, we're bad at making choices. You know, China's probably better than your average democracy at making choices as a society. And, of course, it is hard. But the fact is, you know, society does make choices at the end of the day. And the other thing, perhaps the most fundamental thing for us today, which is even more fundamental than what I just said about the sense of proportion, you know, about, the, about ra ranking the severity, is the right to choose, not the ability to choose, the right to choose, seems to me very clear, completely unequivocal, that if we were to say, oh dear, I think we're going to not be able to cope with this overpopulation problem, let's not develop this anti-aging technology at all. And therefore, 
thereby, if we were to you know, delay the point at which this anti-aging technology actually comes into existence, then what we would be doing is we would be denying a certain cohort of humanity the opportunity to take advantage of these therapies because they wouldn't be developed in time for them, whereas if we had made a different decision, they would have been developed in time. Okay, now the question is, do we have the moral entitlement to do that? to take away that choice from that cohort of future humanity. To me, it's completely obvious that we don't, not only from a purely ethical point of view, but also from a straightforward practical point of view. The fact that humanity in the future is going to know things that we don't know about, for example, whether we have developed good enough solar energy or whatever. You know, so it's like, it's just like, inconceivable to me. It, I just do not understand why people even argue about this. Any other questions at all? Uh, just to... Paul here, huge fan of anti-aging. Uh, thank you for your speech. I have a question regarding the uh, funding um, issue of the industry. Okay, is the question on the lines of uh, what is your bank account number? No. No, well, uh, it's actually like, really interesting in my opinion. Has the Sense Foundation considered issuing a token on a blockchain platform? Yes, we have. So, okay, let me let me briefly address where that is right now. So we are um, pretty. What, what, we have a lot of supporters who are uh, highly interested in that kind of area. Um, one of our major donors, actually, as of this year, is Vitalik Buterin, who started Ethereum. Um, and actually, I'm, uh, I'm interested in your accent because it turns out that most of the people in our community who have been really pursuing this are Russian. Um, um, the, uh, <laughs> and uh, wrong. Uh, 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 well, there you go. Um, uh, so, yes. Um, but, yes, it turns out that um, there's quite a lot going on. We ourselves are not doing it. But a large, reason, a large part of the reason why we're not is because we kind of don't need to because we have supporters who are pursuing it with much better expertise than us. And, um, you know, anything that comes off will come back to us. I would be like, what? I would be really, like, uh, glad to spend some of my Instagram. Okay, please get in touch. Well, look, if, you, if you've got Bitcoin hanging around, then uh, we've got a donation. We've got a donation box at the back. Uh. Yeah, but not on a specific sense. Like, sure, yeah. So... So Luke has my contact information. If you if you if you want to get in touch, please do so, and we will loop you into everything that we're doing in that, that area. Any other questions? So just gentlemen here, just in front of you. Hello. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for the presentation. Thank you. Um, I, I I always get worried when people start that way because they're right. always going to be insulting. <laughs> all right. Perhaps. I'd like to put my question in context. Uh, by saying that when I uh, researched uh, my latest book, uh, Cosmos Sapiens, uh, Human Evolution from the Origin of the Universe, I found Now that, available in all good bookstores. Yes. Right, I found that all but the brightest scientists um, reacted very, very defensively to any questioning of the current paradigm in their particular specialist field, um, even despite a lot of empirical evidence contradicting it. So my question is in two parts. Um, how do you respond to the withering criticisms of SENS by Preston W. Estep III et al. in MIT Technology Review, 11 July 2006, and also by the 28 gerontologists from the European Molecular Biology Organization in 2005 that concluded uh, that your therapies, quote, have, have have never been shown to extend the lifespan of any organization, any organism, uh, let alone humans. Um, the, the, the second part of my question is, um, what 15-year logjams in aging research has SENS broken through in the last couple of years? Sounds good. Okay, so to your first question, um, I'm entertained that you actually incorporated the dates of the things in your question. What are you trying to say, Aubrey? <laughs> most people don't do that. Um, um, uh, I'm also presuming that your question is rhetorical, because as a writer, I'm sure you've done your research, and you know that the 
respective criticisms were accompanied in both cases by responses from me, which appeared to be rather decisive. And there, I say that simply because the um, criticisms of which you speak have not been repeated. And indeed, at this point, we are in the rather nice position where the general concept that I put forward back in 2000 of comprehensive damage repair as a way to do something about aging is actually being reinvented by august grandees within the field um, under the um, somewhat disingenuous pretense that it's a new idea. Uh, so, yeah, so, so this has become an absolutely mainstream orthodox concept. All of the criticisms that were put forward back then have been completely repudiated and only a very small rump of extremely um, vested interest driven gerontologists are still even slightly um, pretending that sense is in any way unscientific. You will find that there are a number of people who were authors of one or, one or both of those publications who are now on our scientific advisory board. That's about as much of a, an about turn as you can imagine. Um, so yes, it's really just a matter of education. I kind of knew this was coming, and indeed something you may not know, I don't think this has been terribly well publicized, is that the um, MIT Technology Review uh, episode was actually orchestrated by us. Um, we actually caused this to happen as a way of, if you like, smoking out the opposition and getting them to actually place their criticisms and their um, uh, denigration of sense on record so that it could be rebutted in contrast to the off-the-record ridicule that had been um, prevailing over the previous year or two. Um, so, yeah, that's all going rather well. Um, now, with regard to the second part of your question, what's happened recently, I'm very gratified to say that we can answer that question in a very concrete manner at this point. Um, I'll stick with just two examples. So, uh, as you, I'm sure, are aware, SENSE consists of seven major strands of research. I would say that if we had to pick out the two of them which had been most log jammed for the previous, uh, for the past, let's say, 15, 20 years, they would be mitochondrial mutations and crosslinks, okay? And both of them have been, have, have actually seen really dramatic breakthroughs from our side, from, from our work, from our funded work over the past couple of years. On mitochondrial mutations, we published a paper just around a year ago now in nucleic acid research, which was a, a much greater progress towards the idea of, put, of, of backing up the mitochondrial DNA in the nucleus than anyone had ever done before. That's an idea that was first put forward in the mid-80s, and basically everybody gave up on it. I basically said people had given up too soon. I was kind of right, but it did take us 10 years to get to the point where we really cracked it. We still have some way to go to really crack it, of course, but... Everybody is taking it and us very seriously right now. So that's very good news. Um, on crosslinking, same kind of thing. The major molecular structure that is responsible for the loss of elasticity of the skin and the major arteries and so on is, was discovered in the mid-90s. And it was established rather quickly that it was the major contributor to this process. But nobody knew anything about what to do about it. They just totally gave up on it in favor of just trying to you know, minimize the rate at which it would come into existence. And again, we basically what we did first was we figured out a way to synthesize the stuff in vitro in a test tube. And that allowed us to move forward in fairly obvious ways, you know, not just measuring it, like, you know, generating antibodies and so on, but also identifying enzymes that would break it down and so on. So that is actually now far enough advanced that within the next few months, it's going to be spun out into a startup company. Yeah, so we're pretty happy about how things have been going. Question just here. Hi, just uh, thank you very much. It was really great, great talk. I'm also a big fan. So I would like just to uh, uh, restore a bit gender balance with questions and also to capitalize that you, if I, on your interest for Russian, because you can, can hear my accent. So anyway, my question is, uh, what your average person who is very, very uh, kind of passionate about anti-aging can do? Yeah. Let's say I'm not millionaire, 
And uh, let's uh, let's yeah. say you're not a millionaire, okay? But, <laughs> <laughs> but if you are, yeah. <laughs> but I really would like to contribute. I'm, for example, I'm biomedical researcher, so I understand kind of technological bit of it as well. Okay, okay, yeah. So right, so yeah. Any millionaires in the audience? Please see me afterwards. Um, um, <laughs> Any biomedical researchers in the audience, also, you know, please see me afterwards or at least write to me because the fact is we do have a pretty damn good idea about which areas of research are the most important and the most neglected and we want to maximise the personnel. There, I mean, ultimately, biology, biological research is really manpower intensive. So, absolutely, we want people to be informed about what choices to make in terms of their career direction. Um, however, for everybody else... At the end of the day, there's just one, a one word answer to that question, which is advocacy. You know, I spend my entire life going around telling the tale, right? Giving people a good idea about where things are and disabusing people, getting people to realize that this is feasible and it is desirable. And I feel that I do what I do really well. But the fact is, I only do what I do. And advocacy is a curious thing. It's something that well, everybody's different. Everybody has different audiences. There are people who just won't listen to me because I've got a beard or because I've got an English accent or whatever it is, right? And so there are masses of people out there that other people can communicate to better than I can. Diversity, variety of messaging and messenger is vital. So I want everybody here who is in favor of all of this work to get doing that. And the way to do it is very simple. Number one, learn the right answers. Learn enough biology so that you don't make a fool of yourself, which isn't very much. You don't need to know that much. But also, very important, learn enough about the answers I give and the answers that other people who've been around a long time give so that you don't give stupid answers. You know, one thing that really pisses me off is when really well-meaning people in this field will be asked the question, the overpopulation question, and, all that, and they'll say, don't worry, we'll all go into space. Now, now, I am not saying that it's impossible that we'll all go into space. I am saying that it's impossible that that would be a permanent solution. Anyone who knows enough math to know that exponential functions overtake polynomial functions can answer that. But the fact is that whether or not it's a realistic answer... It's not a persuasive answer because most people don't want to go into space. So please, for fuck's sake, pay attention to what people want to hear. All right. We've probably got time for one more question. Let's make it easy for you then. So mine's a bit of a technical question. Slightly. Go ahead. So most, um, most of your therapies re require like some advanced form of delivery. So currently we use viruses quite a bit. Um, so my question is, so your approach for cancer is deleting um, certain genes that allow cells to extend their telomeres. Yep, yep. um, how would you, do we, well, do we need to develop any new kind of delivery methods or do, are there existing ones that would allow us to effectively deliver like a, a way of deleting that gene to enough cells in the body that we can effectively right, yeah. so, prevent so cancer? Two part, all right, two-part answer. So first answer is specifically with regard to disrupting genes or indeed making other small modifications to genes. Um, of course, everyone here has not heard of CRISPR. Many of you may know that CRISPR is not quite specific enough. You know, it has off-target effects that are, you know, low-ish, but they happen. Uh, but everybody has kind of known that that's an important problem to solve, and work has been going on pretty damn feverishly for the past five years um, trying to improve that. And at this point... My understanding, based on the best people, including George Church, for example, a very prominent guy who is also on our scientific advisory board, um, is that basically we're there, uh, that we now have ways to make targeted modifications to the genome that have high penetrance, in other words, they affect a large number of cells in vivo, and they have basically zero um, off-target impact. Second part of the answer relates to a lot of it relates to a lot of sense because what we need to do in many cases in sense is not just to disrupt existing genes but actually to insert new DNA. For example, backup copies of the mitochondrial DNA in the nucleus. Now CRISPR doesn't do that. 
and nor does any of the you know, new versions of CRISPR and so on. They just make small modifications. So our approach to fixing that, to, to addressing that problem, is we have identified a type of bacteriophage, a bacterial virus, which is, again, very, very, very site-specific, really doesn't mess up anywhere else other than what you want to. But the problem with this virus is that unlike CRISPR, you can't customize its landing site. CRISPR, as you know, you know, it has a guide RNA, right? You can say which part of the genome is going to be disrupted. This bacteriophage, you can't do that. And sure enough, it won't surprise you since it's a bacteriophage, so it's host is a bacterium, the landing pad where it's evolved to go to doesn't exist in the mammalian genome, uh, right? So it doesn't do anything when you put it in. Now, people have tried for a while to kind of in vitro evolve the enzyme so that it has a different target site. Didn't work. You know, it's just too hard. So what we've done instead is we've decided to go a two-step strategy. Number one, use CRISPR, or rather the novel versions, right, to put in the landing pad, to put in the landing pad into, the, into a safe, you know, highly transcribed site in the, um, in the human genome. And then step two, use our bacteriophage to get this, yeah, all right. And it works. Um, so we've already got now mice which have the landing pad inserted into Rosa 26, well-known, you know, well-characterized locus. And we are just starting a project using that, um, those mice, characterizing them to see exactly how well we can get, you know, reported DNA initially, of course, um, into, into that in different tissues. Yeah, it's, it's obviously a very important question. It's a question that we've understood to be important for a very long time. And actually, we should be a few years ahead of where we are with this now, if, and we would be if it hadn't been for a lack of money. So we're going to conclude this with another one of Aubrey's favorite games, which requires everybody to put their hand in the air. No, in that pocket and, um, and bring out a quid. Oh, I see what you're doing. No, if everybody can put just their hand in the air. Oh, my God. Wow. Okay. All right. And put it down if you don't want to live till tomorrow. What? <laughs> <laughs> Graham, I don't know what's happening with you, but we need to have a chat, mate. Wait, um, if you don't want to live till 80, if you don't want to live till 100, if you don't want to live till 200, if you don't want to live to 1,000, and if you don't want to live forever. Wow. Okay. That's... um. Fucking scary. Um, so, Aubrey, I'm going to ask you a very final question, which is really about you as an individual, because you really do understand your mimetic power. You you really understand sort of the, the best way to present unconventional ideas. I think you've described it once before as you understand how to be a successful heretic. And I just wonder if you could... Uh, could share some of, your, some of your advice for any individuals who wanted to share these ideas, especially the people who want to live forever, how best they can go about doing that. Do they have to grow a wonderful and very beautiful wizardry beard, or can it, they do it, it, it through it other means? Well, the beard doesn't hurt, I'm telling you that. But um, Get but, growing. you got, you got <laughs> your entire fucking life it to only do took, it. It only took, <laughs> it, it only took me two years. Till eternity. Uh, it only took me two years. Um, 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 so yeah, I, I did actually give a talk at TED, um, not my main talk, but there is one, I think it's online in, in a few iterations, called How to Be a Successful Heretic. So try and dig that out if you really want to know. But the first, uh, I, I, with a kind of 10-point plan, because um, uh, I actually, um, it was based on the TED. So when you give a talk at TED, okay, you probably don't know this. This is one of the most extraordinary things. So. Um, the guy who runs TED, a guy named Chris Anderson, he went to Oxford. And, you know, Oxford and Cambridge, they have this competition, right? I went to Cambridge, obviously. Um, you know, so Cambridge is better at certain things, like, for example, science. And, and like, Oxford is much better at certain things, like, for example, being so spectacularly pretentious that you don't even know whether they're joking, right? So, um, um, so uh, in, in the case of TED, um, Chris had this um, idea that he would send prospective speakers before they spoke, he would send them this thing called the TED Commandments. And I kid you not, they actually send you a piece of stone. I mean, it costs them money, you know, they FedEx it to... 
it's a piece. I mean, for fuck's sake. And and it says things like, "Thou shalt not give thy usual shtick," and so on, and uh, and like, "Thou shalt not sell from the." St um, uh, I'm sure I had a reason for telling. Oh, this. yeah, hold on, uh, Aubrey. We were talking about how to be a good heretic. That's right. So, 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 so I just it involves uh, stones. Uh, I decided to um to kind of give a bit of a parody of this one day. Uh, up Ted. So anyway, um, long and short of it is, my first thing was be right. You know, um, diligence before oratory is what I th said, something like that. Um, you know, I mean, there is no point in trying to sell an idea that's radical unless it's true. So you know, um, you know, actually study what I've done, you know, and said and 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 worked out, and make sure that you give a faithful representation of it, both science and the advocacy side. And then all the other things I said, well, you know, be everywhere, you know, travel a lot. I said something like a pint is worth a thousand words mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, um, and be funny. You know, I, I have the distinction of being the only scientist who ever went on the Colbert Report and actually made Colbert laugh. Um, uh, you know, so um, things like that. You know, it's all obvious stuff, really, but it's not as easy as it sounds. So, on that note, I owe Aubrey many, many beers for his thousands and thousands of words tonight. And I want to thank the Library Club um, for hosting us. I, I apologize I apologize profusely about the chairs, but I love the fact that the Virtual Futures audience were, were willing to, to stand and listen to this conversation. I also want to help, thank you uh, to our volunteers for helping us uh, film tonight's event and to and to run the mic. Then they're, they're not just there to film and run the mic. Stephen is running our Near Future Fictions series, which runs throughout next year. Our submission deadline is the 21st of December of this year. So if you're a short fiction writer, please come and see Stephen, the gentleman with the microphone, at the end. And thank you to Halodonso, who was helping with uh, filming today. He's a, he's a wonderful cyborg artist in his own right, and do get a chance to uh, to talk to him. So if you like what we do, we're, we're entirely audience uh, funded. So please do support us on Patreon or just find out more about us online. And we're pretty much at Virtual Futures everywhere you social media. And I want to thank you, the audience, again, for, for sitting through an hour and a half of uh, deep dive conversations, the potential of living forever. But what I really want to do is end with this, which is a warning. And it's the same warning we, wear, we end every single Virtual Futures with. And it's very simple. It's the fact that the future is always virtual, and some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you'll feel you've done that this evening. Please join me in thanking the incredible Dr. Albie de Grey. The bar is now open.